Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Tiffany in Rome, Katie in Seattle. Katie, sick with a cold, what, two months ago now? And voice still not quite sounding right? Really starting to get annoying. However, that is not what we're talking about today. I am reading a book right now that is called Martyr, Martyr with an exclamation point, written by Kavi Akbar. I'm going to be interviewing him for this show. He is a poet. This is his very first novel. And he introduces a concept in this book several times, and I've only marked it once, but I thought it would be interesting enough for us to talk about. And basically the concept is the limitations of language, which seem especially important when you're dealing with what a poet is writing because you think about Mm -hmm. poetry and how carefully they have to choose the few words that they use so I'm sure the limitation of language is something he thinks about a lot and certainly something I will ask him about but even still so let me just read you this one line that he writes and then we can riff from there okay I am actually going to read you this whole paragraph it's a little tiny paragraph it's about characters that you don't know anything about because you haven't read this book and it doesn't matter You'll get the concept, okay? Okay. Leela was so good at wearing sunglasses. I found myself watching them, watching her more than I was actually listening to her. It is ridiculous to say that she was beautiful. A horse is beautiful. A mountain or an ocean is beautiful. Leela in those sunglasses was something else, something beyond language. I get frustrated this way so often. A photograph can say, this is what it was. Language can only say... This is what it was like. Interesting. Yes. And I think about the constrictions of language pretty often, I feel, partly because I'm (laughs) in the midst of writing a book, and sometimes I'll sit there for hours just trying to figure out how to say this one sentence so it conveys something deeper than it might say on the surface. But I've experienced this too with like, I mean, just imagine any time you find that you really love someone or you really want to express like how much you love that person, it feels like no matter what you say is completely trite. And, and we have so many trite things to say about it, particularly love. Like, I love you to the moon and back. You know, I love you <laughs> as big as the ocean is wide or whatever it is. All of it does not convey how you actually feel about that person in your heart. And I think language fails us from being able to express the width and breadth of what we feel in life from time to time. But uh, I thought it was something that we could bat around a little bit uh, about language, and particularly maybe with the slant of like, you know, you speak two languages. You speak English and Italian fluently. And does that help you express yourself at all? Does that help you not fall into cliche as much? Let's just (laughs) throw it all on the table. Mm. I have lots of thoughts about cliches, one of which I was just thinking the other day. You know the word voracious. Mm -hmm. We never use the word voracious in any context with the exception of she was a voracious reader and maybe he was a voracious eater, I guess. But you don't really hear that. Voracious reader, though. I hear you you have a voracious appetite. I I do hear that. Sure. But I mean, anybody who's hungry, right? Extremely hungry. I mean, I guess. Is that it? I don't know. Let's look it up. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever looked it the, up. <laughs> what is the definition of voracious? Wanting to devour. I would, If I had to guess, I would say like the desire to devour something. Okay. Wanting to devour great oh. quantities of food. Adjective. I nailed it. He had a vor- I nailed it. He had a voracious appetite. But think about it when it comes into the context of reading. Anybody mm-hmm. who reads a normal amount. Like any time a person likes to sit down with a book, what do we call them? We call them a voracious reader. In life, she was a voracious reader. I wouldn't say that about someone who reads a normal amount. I would say that about someone who reads a lot. Would you say that you're a voracious reader? Yes. But wouldn't you also say that it's a cliche to say that? (laughs) It is a cliche, but it is also true. And and cliches are used. I'm I'm not a fan of cliches, but I do think that cliches are used because they're true. Right. Not always, but a lot of the time, like you, you, you use a cliche and you're like, you always apologize for it. I know this is a cliche, but I love you more than my own life or whatever. You know, I'll say that, <laughs> I, I'd say that about my child. Like, it's a cliche, but I, I love him more than my own life. It's a cliche because it's true. It's right. used because it's true. Right. 
But if you were going to try to describe what you actually mean by that, like the breadth of your love for your child. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. I mean, if I were writing an article or an essay or a book, I wouldn't use that expression. No, okay. because that's an expression that you use in speech <sighs> right? as a place filler when you know you can't sit and describe it. Maybe because maybe it's a cliche because maybe people use cliches because people People always people understand you right away when you use that cliche. I'm just being the devil's advocate right now, Katie, because I, I can tell you don't like cliches. So I'm like, I'm on the side <laughs> of the cliche. We use cliches because we know that then we don't have to go in deep and ex try to explain it in a poetic way. Yes. If it's a you know, spoken language, it just is kind of, you know, people understand what you're talking about. Yeah, but is it also just because our language is so limited that to like try to describe being a voracious reader in any other way would feel cumbersome and pointless. I don't think it's because our language is limited. I think it's because we're lazy with, okay. with how we use our language. I mean, I, I'm not going to speak for other languages, but definitely in English, I think that we're all, all English, all, all, maybe not all, but you know, most English speakers are lazy in the way that they use their language. And our, the English language is an, I believe, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to debate this with you and to hear more about what this author says and this poet says, but I happen to think that the English language is incredibly rich. And of course it has its limits as all languages do. I sometimes say to Italian people, and they never believe me, that there are more, many more words in the English language than there are in Italian or pretty much any other romance language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people scoff at this and say, no, it's not true. It couldn't possibly be true. It's true. English has many, many more words yes. than typical European languages, at least. And it draws from so many diff different cultures to get all those words, exactly. which is another exactly. interesting thing. Yeah. Like you were describing before we even got on that the German word schadenfreude, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, is one that we actually use in English because we don't have a word for it, but we've borrowed it enough into English that we now consider it one of our terms, <laughs> you know, even though it's blatantly a German term. Yeah, well, we have tons of tons of borrowed words, um, although I don't think we're unique for that. But also English is derived from so many different languages. It's a Germanic language, but it's also, there's tons of Latin influence in it. There's also Greek influence in it. There's also, believe it or not, Sanskrit influence in English. Like there's a lot, English has a lot of varied ancestors. And I think that's one of the things that makes it a rich language. Do you know where Sanskrit appears? As no, I don't. I, I just remember learning that uh -huh. when I was doing my yoga training, there was like a Sanskrit teacher. And, and I just remember her saying that one of the origin languages of English is Sanskrit. I mean, it's not like one of the main origin languages, mm -hmm. which are Latin, Latin and German, obviously. But it's there. It's there. Yeah. Somehow. Before we completely stray across cliches, I have to say one that I know my listening father is waiting for, which is his least favorite one. And as a result, has also become my least favorite one because it's used by everybody who speaks English. I see it written in books. I see it given in speeches. It's almost as if we expect that it must be delivered this way. And that is the phrase each and every. Each and every time. We are happy to welcome each and every one of you. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. Each and every one of us is welcome at this banquet table. Is that a cliche though, or is that just a like a like a verbal tick? Like it can't uh, really be a tick when people think that it must always be both together, right? But like, that's what makes it a tick. It's like something like you can't help but say each and every. Like you can't just say each. You've got to say each and every. Like I know people who have got to say literally, like I do all the time. I know guilty, but you know people <laughs> who just they cannot help putting that word in, whether it's accurate or not of course it's redundant though I it could, is redundant that, I, that for sure you can happily and i want to encourage all of you if you ever have to give a speech and you want to welcome people to the room you can just say i want to welcome each of you to our show tonight <laughs> if you want to put each in there or you could just say i want to welcome you to tonight's program whatever but just don't do each and every unless you want to say i want to welcome every one of you or i want to welcome each of you just uh you know Pick one or the other. Or Just try it on for size. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, because that's what it's supposed to mean. It means you as the individual and all of us as the collective. That's like what it's meant to mean, I suppose. But each includes all of us, as does everyone includes all of us. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, it's a personal pet peeve and you will never find it in anything that I ever write. I can guarantee you that. And I would be (laughs) hard pressed to ever say it, I feel. But, you know, you might catch me Uh tripping up on that out of, as you say, Laziness. Now I'm going to be very aware of that expression. It's not something that I use very often. I don't give a lot of speeches, so it doesn't really come to mind. Uh, but now <laughs> I'm going to be, be making sure I don't use it. But I'm, I know I have pet peeves like, like that, something. I just, they're not coming to my mind. I mean, I hate it when people use the word literally wrong, but I, I use the word literally uh-huh. wrong and I know I'm using it wrong and I just do it because I forget to stop myself I don't know well you but know, I do I, I do hate that you know what else is funny is because we've talked about that on the show before and I feel like every time you mention that you really hate when people say that you say it twice as much and then I'm going through the show afterwards and just trying okay, to take it out careful. take it out so that it doesn't be like <laughs> undo your point because you know that is yeah. the magic of editing audio is I can alter what you say Uh, I don't alter your meaning, but I can like strip certain things away. And so I'm like, if you've personally highlighted it in the show, then I make painstakingly, uh, a hard painstaking effort to actually get as many of them out of it as I possibly can. I appreciate that because you're making me look better. But really, that kind of proves my point, if you think about it, that it's so, (laughs) it's everywhere this overuse of the word literally that even I who can't stand it can't stop doing it Mm -hmm. which is interesting so starting where we began though with the limitations of language about how it's sometimes impossible to express what you're seeing or feeling I mean I mean we could debate his idea his notion here that a a photograph can say this is what it was and a language can only say this is what it was like because I think a photograph gives you at least the picture of what was happening at the moment. It doesn't necessarily convey the feeling of what was happening in the moment, unless the facial expressions are so extreme, <laughs> you know, that you can be like, looks like everybody's laughing. Although, mm-hmm. uh, as you well know, even that can be changed and doctored in these modern er- this modern era. Like, uh, there's a picture that you love to post of me on, on Instagram, and I think I told you of me laughing in a wine field. And I think I told you once that that was completely staged. I was just walking around the wine field, the grapes, you know, the, not the wine field, like whatever. The vineyard. The vineyard, vineyard. thank you. The wine field. (laughs) Everybody join me in the wine field. Talk about a limitation of language right there. No, but actually that's probably the the direct translation. (laughs) If If you were to translate it into really like basic English, that's really what it means. Yeah, well, and here I am walking around just, looking at the grapes and Derek says pretend you're having the most wonderful time you've ever been having in your life and I did that and he took a picture but so it's completely staged but it does look joyous I don't know that I I knew that Katie (laughs) I love that photo it's one of my favorite photos of you actually um now you've kind of ruined it for me sorry about that um you can post it again along with this episode and see if anybody can tell if it's faked or not I mean I was having a good day so it wasn't that it was a completely boring day. It's just a little bit of an exaggerated uh, joy <laughs> that I'm doing in yeah. that photo. I always tell Claudio, this is an aside. He always gets annoyed when I'm taking so many pictures. And, and I always say, come on, pretend you're happy. <laughs> pretend you're happy. <laughs> yeah, and does like, he? He does. He does. If I bug him enough, there's a picture. I'll post this too. There was a picture um, that I took on Christmas Eve. Because I was with my sister's in law and my younger sister in law's boyfriend was there, Aurelio, and I was like, "Come on, Claudio, let's let's take get in the picture." He's like, "Oh, come, uh, uh. you know, my party pooper husband," um, <laughs> rolling his eyes, and finally, and everybody is like, "It's such a great picture because everybody is cracking up about the fact that Claudio is making such a big stink about having to be in this picture." And whoever took the picture took like two. I think it was me. I think it was a selfie. Took like two or three. And like one of them, he's like walking away, like very sure, grumpy. And now he's getting out of there, but he has this little smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of thought it was amusing, actually. That's good. <laughs> uh, Derek is also like really, really good at uh, pretending to be having a wonderful time 
at parties in uh-huh. pictures. Like if I turn a camera toward him, <laughs> he'll just throw his head back and make a like <laughs> kind of laughing. Such an American thing. Can I tell you, living outside of America, like I feel like all Americans have that to some degree, have that talent. It's not a typical thing over here. And in fact, when I was looking at pictures in this summer when we were at the lake house that we had rented with my my mom and my stepfather, and every single picture in which there's my mom and my stepfather and my father and mother-in-law, right? Every single picture. And I'm sure that, you know, me taking the picture, I'm like, okay, everybody turn and look at me. Every single picture, my mom and my stepfather have these like brilliant smiles on their face. Like they look like they could be in a catalog. Like they're just they, they're uh-huh. like a travel magazine. They've got these big smiles. And in every single picture, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are either like talking, looking away, rubbing their nose, like looking down. <laughs> no, they never, ever pose. Like they never do that thing because it's an American thing. Wow. So I would almost prefer to live in Italy then because I I really don't love when everyone's like (laughs) grabs the camera and is like, all right, everybody, put your arms around each other. Say hi. You know, I kind of I kind of can't stand that kind of stuff. But anyway, back to the original, uh, the original topic, to the idea of the limitations of language. I'm curious, since you are bilingual, if that has limited your language by learning two languages and living within two languages all the time or if it has expanded like are you able to express more than you ever could before because you have two languages to draw from well I'll share with you a secret Katie (laughs) okay when you are living in a foreign language and the people in your life don't speak your language or at least they don't speak it very much Mm -hmm. you can take cliches from your own language translate them into the foreign language and everybody thinks it's an original idea oh that's interesting (laughs) it's my secret trick of being charming no i'm i'm I'm, i mean i'm kind of joking but you can you it often happens that you can translate a cliche and it's not a cliche in that language and Mm -hmm. um so it kind of it kind of gets a new freshness which is kind of nice. So it makes you feel like you're extra, like it makes you sound extra clever where somebody's like, I never exactly. thought to call my husband, my partner in crime before. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's a great example. How would you say that Claudio was your partner in crime in Italian? <laughs> no deal. Um, he's my um, complice. You would just, I guess you would say complice. Like, like he's my accomplice. Like accomplice. Mm-hmm. He's my accomplice. Crime? I don't even know what the word for crime. Crimine? Crimine? Um, I know reato is like a crime. It's like the noun. Ho fatto un reato. I did a crime. I don't think you would say a complice in un reato. I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it translates directly, although uh, native Italian speakers go, feel free to write in and tell me that it does and there's a better way of saying it that I can't think of right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but they do use the word complice which is an adjective that means now I'm not now I'm thinking what's the English word for it complicita is the noun um complice is the adjective so it's like siamo molto complici we're really complici we're really it, it's it's a word that I'm gonna have to look it up now because I can't think of if there's an English <laughs> word for it it describes it's a non-cliche way. It's just a regular word. But it describes when, like, you have that sort of feeling with someone where you're sort of up to the same thing. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. You know, you kind of have the same ideas and you kind of um, are on the right, on the same track. You know, you have the same sense of humor. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, as we would say in English, perhaps, as the cliched way we would say that in English would be, we're joined at the hip, maybe. We are in lockstep with one another. We are in lockstep. Maybe is closer. I feel like joined at the hip just means you're always together. Yeah, maybe that's true. It says true. you're complice, uh, complicit. That there, there is a word then. Complicit. You're complicit. Now that complicit, I... which is seems like a, actually an odd usage in that regard. Honestly. Well, it's kind of a negative positive word. It can be used for crime. Here, here we go. Complice, one who participates in a crime. An accomplice, an accessory. Okay. Um, but then it says complice, conspiratorial. It can denote cons- like conspiracy or complicit. But th- th- there really only are the literal uh, examples here. 
I guess conspiratorial. Su sguardo complice mi ha molto rassicurata. Your conspiratorial look really reassured me. So I guess conspiratorial, complicit, but it's not, unless it's used like in an actual crime situation where they're talking about accomplices, like true accomplices. Yeah. Usually it's not a negative. I mean, I guess it can be negative or positive because you can say like, for example, this is a horrible example, but let's just, it's the first one that popped in my head. A parent whose child is being abused by their other partner and doesn't do anything is complice. They're complicit, right? Right. So it can be used in that very, very horrible, ugly way, but it can also be used in like, you know, here we are two couples having dinner and somebody says something and, you know, you give each other a sideways look. It's kind of the same sort of, it's the same word used in a different situation. Right. Comes you, from the same root. Right. Used as like affection versus actually committing crimes together. Exactly. Just like exactly. my partner in crime, I hope yeah, is used so... in most cases because I don't know that most people <laughs> posting on Facebook about happy anniversary to my partner in crime are actually saying like, yeah, we, we robbed a bank <laughs> last week and we're doing another one tomorrow. <laughs> happy 30th anniversary. Uh, hardly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. you, we know that like you can turn a cliche and actually sound more clever in Italian in that yeah. regard, but would you, how? And, and, and the other way around as well from Italian to English. Uh, I had a, Puerto Rican boyfriend for many years and he used to say and I don't know if this is because this is how it's used in Spanish or if just he kind of got the cliche wrong but he used to say feed my pupils instead of feed my eyes or feast my eyes I guess is the English I want to feast my eyes on you and he used to say feed my pupils um Ugh. I actually loved it I, I mean <laughs> I, I loved him at the time so uh so yeah. it was okay but I just remember we were at a jewelry store once and the guy came up and asked if he could help us. And he's like, oh, no, thanks. We're just feeding our pupils. And the guy was like delighted by this expression. He thought it was so clever. <laughs> I don't know. There's something very kind of uh, almost clinical about it. But maybe that's because, you know, <laughs> for me, I feel like the only time people use the word pupils is when they're like, can I dilate these? I'm going to dilate your <laughs> pupils. <laughs> you know, It's like at the uh, at the annual eye exam, can I dilate your pupils? And I always say, no, please don't. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. That is kind of cute. I definitely have had um, circumstances like that where, and that's part of the delight of being with a person who speaks a different language than yourself is seeing how they use words in different ways that you would never think to put together. We've talked about that a little mm -hmm. bit on this show because mm -hmm. occasionally you'll say something where I'll be like, oh my gosh, I love that usage. And it will be like you trying to translate you know, some Italian idea into English, but it will push all these words together that I would have never thought of putting together, you know. I wish you would tell me when I do that, because one time you mentioned specifically in, you know, you said in this episode, you said, you know, something like that, but you never told me what it was. And I, I couldn't find it. Like, I mean, I didn't really search for it, but but I listened to the episode, of course, nothing popped out at me that seemed weird. Like, oh, that's not how you would say it in English. So next time, tell me so that I know. I'll try to be, I'll make a point of pointing it out. Well, okay. So in, but in talking about the limitation of language to describe things, and of course, now that we've gotten way into cliches, are there a lot of cliches in, I mean, you've learned several romance languages. I don't know that you would consider yourself fluent in anything but Italian, but are there a lot of cliches running around in French and Spanish and Gosh. Italian? Well, I don't speak Spanish, never have. French, I did speak. I now speak very little. Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, like, again, I can't speak for languages, non-European languages, because I feel like I'm not familiar with them at all. But definitely a lot in Italian that I can think of and a couple in French that I can think of. So I think it's probably universal. You know, somebody once came up with a clever simile, metaphor, what have you, expression, and it just caught on and it just became part of the lexicon of the language. Right? Don't you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure, obviously. Um, well, before we run out of time, though, one thing we had talked about a little bit before we got into this was that there are several Native Amer American languages that have words that don't exist. I mean, you were saying a lot of languages have words that don't actually exist in other languages and, and how that they can like capture an idea in a way that we don't even have access to. Mm -hmm. Like It would take like a, a sentence or two in our language to describe what they have one word for. Right. And you uh, have a couple of good examples of that? 
Yeah, yeah. I looked I looked some up. So okay, this is super cute. Um Kummerspeck. I'm trying to pronounce the German correctly. We'll not judge. Kummerspeck literally means grief bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Which means what? Grief bacon. Which basically refer, it refers to weight that has been gained due to excessive eating when you're sad. Ah, oh, grief bacon. <laughs> Okay. Isn't that great? <laughs> I do like that. It takes a little bit to unfold, um, but like you were saying, like, yeah, it takes a little bit to unfold in the English language, but I'd like it. Okay. This is cool. In Indonesian, the word, okay, I do not know how to pronounce this. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Menkolek or menkolek in Indonesian. It is the thing that some people do when they tap someone on the opposite shoulder to get them to look in the wrong direction. Oh, we have well. a word for that. <laughs> That's interesting. That must mean that yeah. something culturally makes that so relevant that there actually had to be a term for it. I guess so. In Hawaiian, they say panapo'o uh, to mean when you scratch your head to help you remember something you've forgotten. Mm. A lot of these things, sense. though, I can't think of. Well, I guess with the exception of the grief bacon, I can't really feel like when would you use that in conversation? Would you just say, like, if I tapped you on the shoulder and you looked in the opposite direction, I would say, hey, I just, what do I say? Use that word. I forget what it was now. Uh, like, what, what if you were trying to describe, like, you were, it happened in a book, you know what I mean? You, yeah, you, I guess You had to describe true. it. They would just say, they just, membolek or whatever the word was. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one in Russian. Razbluto. I'm trying to do the accent. Rosbluto. It's the word referring to the feelings that you have towards someone you once loved but no longer do. Hmm. I like that one. And in Japanese, koi no yukan means the feeling when you meet someone and you know that it's inevitable you'll fall in love with them. Oh, I love that too. Love at first sight, as we would say in English. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose. But they, this is more specific that you will fall in love with some, them and it's, and it's inevitable that it is going to happen. Like it cannot oh. be undone. Yeah. This, this is good. In Scottish, tartle. I'm again, trying to, trying to create an accent. But tartle is the moment of hesitation before introducing someone because you can't remember their name. <laughs> <laughs> That's like that's that's perfect for me. That is good. A tartle. Yes, where you're like, uh, tartle. I want you to meet my friends. Uh that's really lovely. And in German you can say fisselig. Fisselig. It's being flustered to the point of incompetence thanks to being watched by someone important. That is so specific. <laughs> and yet we've all like been there giving a presentation at some point in our life, right? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's lovely uh, yeah these are great these are great but to close katie you know you you brought this subject up and i can only imagine that it's because and you you said yourself that as a writer you often struggle to describe things because i know for me <laughs> it's usually more like there's something happening in this scene something physical that's happening and i can't figure out how to describe it so that you can picture it in your mind's eye. Because I think there's nothing more annoying than reading a book and they're describing something very, you know, very physical, very basic, not deep emotions, nothing like that, but just like how people are moving around. And I can't, like they do it in a clumsy way and I can't picture it and I have to read it like two or three times. So I really try to explain things, especially since I write for younger readers, really clearly. And sometimes it's like, this would be so obvious if it was just two people doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but I cannot figure out how to describe this without using like 20 sentences yeah i i have that same problem i think moving people from one place to another and also having them kind of react to one another without having it be like constant shoulder shrugging and eye rolling and like you know uh. things that we never really do <laughs> like in real life i don't you know i never roll my eyes in real life unless i'm i'm making some kind of joke like oh please you know <laughs> <laughs> with, oh, I roll my eyes constantly. <laughs> yeah, well, I know, but it just seems like, or, you know, she shrugged, she nodded, she smiled, she laughed, she grinned, she chuckled, you know, you're just like, ah, and then, yeah, heaven forbid you have to move them across a train platform or something, <laughs> you oh, know, or God. have them get into a tussle and drop their luggage or something. It's just, it is interesting how long some of those movements take 
But I also try yeah. to remember, too, a, a piece of advice that I gave um, a friend of mine once. He wasn't describing an action, but he was describing a room in a book he was writing. And I said, you know, I can fill in some of these details on my own. Like, you don't need to tell me that it was a yellow table. I'll make the table whatever I color I want, unless it's very important to you that it's a yellow table. If it matters that I it's totally yellow, agree. then great. <laughs> if- I totally 100% agree. And I read a comic, because I follow a lot of um, not just writers on Instagram, but like people who do like editing services and things like this, freelance editors. And I, I read a post from someone once saying, give me details. Don't say I was standing at the end of the aisle. Say I was standing next uh, at the end of the aisle where the pretzels are hmm. in front of the pretzels. And I just thought, I don't know about you, but I would say absolutely not. I, I don't, <laughs> telling me that that's the, where the pretzels are is totally taking me out of the action. Mm-hmm. You know, it, there's no reason I need to know there are pretzels there. Now, that's not to say you can't add details. I love details. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kind of feel like the details have to be there for a reason. They have to be informing something. Right. Um, and just the fact that at the end of that particular aisle, there are pretzels, that's not telling me anything. It's just superfluous information. It's telling you you're in the snack aisle. I mean, I guess. If that's I, I important. That... If that's important, yeah. which it may not yeah. be. <laughs> and I think also, like, if you're, I'm trying to, like, picture a scene in which two people bump into each other at a train station and the luggage goes everywhere. You can, I mean, this is one of the great things about writing. You know, there's, like, you can just leave stuff out and just make it self-evident. You can just be, like, uh, and suddenly all the luggage was on the floor. You know, I mean, and obviously, mm-hmm. a little bit better worded than that. But yes. in, a, in a way that makes you be able to put two and two together and be like, these people just ran into each other. Right. Yes. They but, ran into each uh, other and flew into each other's arms and the luggage went everywhere. But the last thing I want to ask you, <laughs> because of what you mentioned right before, do you have your own personal tick, like your own personal, like physical manifestation that you always use that you have to stop yourself from using? Because I have a couple. You mean in, in writing? The- or in, in talking, writing, like physical things that people do usually with their faces mm. um, that I, I put in there to try to like explain their what they're feeling, what's going on in their mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to stop myself from doing it because I, it's too much. It's <laughs> yeah. too much. Uh, My- I'm sure there are. Uh, Is it shrugging? Is that one yours? I shrugging? Think, yeah, I think shrugging. I mean, but sometimes you need these things. Sometimes a, sh- a good do. shrug no, is so beautiful. Yeah, sometimes a good shrug is like a lovely, lovely thing. But I mean, I think I, I struggle with, I, I, I don't know, I guess it's not a tick because I struggle with ways to do it differently. But, you know, it, it's like if people are laughing together or like it's like a moderate laugh, but it's not really... This is where I actually feel a real limitation in language is like how to describe laughter. Because she laughed, great. But what if I just said she laughed? She laughed again. Okay, I can do that sometimes. That sounds great. But like what if the whole scene is full of people laughing? Then it's like he laughed, she laughed, everybody laughed. We were having such a wonderful time, you know? So you're trying to like also convey like he didn't think it was that funny. So what did he do? He chuckled. I mean, the limitations <laughs> of how many things you could say to mean laugh, like guffaw. Who guffaws? He guffawed. You know, you'd be like, no, that's not right. He did definitely didn't guffaw, you know. And so then I'm just like searching the interwebs, trying to find other things for laugh. And then I'm like, oh, he just laughed. That's that's what well, he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not one to snickered. Oh, I mean, there's just over you. No, but I mean, I'm not. Look, I'm not one to say, you know, to overuse the thesaurus, but I mean, just the fact that in English there are so many ways to say laugh. Don't think that that is, like, don't take that for granted. I don't think there are 10 ways to say laugh in Italian. Uh, We've got giggle, chuckle, uh, titter, uh, guffaw. What was the other one you just said? Snicker. Um, <laughs> snicker. Laugh, obviously. Uh, I mean, there's there are a lot of ways to say laugh. There are a lot of ways to say cry. I don't know that Italian has so many ways. Mm. You know, I'll have to look, I'll have to look it up. I'll see. Um, interesting yes but yeah my tics are like physical tics that my leading character particularly always does is she always swallows hard Uh (laughs) uh-huh she swallowed hard i remember that from reading one of your early drafts she does swallow hard like and uh, (laughs) (laughs) no she's just (laughs) trying to get her courage up i think yeah and the other one is like she sucked in her lips 
Those are the two things That's that the sound I, of I it. always have my people do. It's sucked and, in her and, lips. That's an odd one. Like, you know, like when you have, an, like, you have a thought and you're kind of afraid uh, to say it. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of like something you might do. Like you're trying to keep yourself from talking. Yeah, kind of. Or like you're, it's a little surprise. It's a little bit like shock, but not majorly. More like, oh mm-hmm. my gosh, like I got to, like, okay, don't say what you're thinking uh-huh. kind of thing. Interesting. Um, okay. But yeah it's um it is i de- it's no it is definitely true that there are limitations uh-huh. um but i think we have it better than some other languages i really do i'd have to talk to a translator mm-hmm. i met a woman at a, at a wedding who was that was her job translating mm-hmm. literature from english to italian she was yeah. italian so i'd have to ask her like what do you think which language is richer yeah, I'm interested to know. And and also that, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about how translators have to take, it, say, a book written in English and convey the same idea of what the person's trying to convey in another language. Is uh, mm-hmm. I believe we did an episode way, way back in the day where I think it might even be called Translate, where I interviewed an author about what it was like to work with a translator to have their book translated with yeah. the translator calling up and being like, what exactly did you mean by whatever line mm-hmm. and then he has to try to convey the feeling of what he was trying to convey by what he wrote so that yeah. she can figure out how to put that into italian in That's a totally hard. different way because some of those words don't exist probably as we've come yeah to or the feelings and the connotations don't carry they don't carry across mm-hmm. all right well i will try to remember and i will strive to pick that up with kave akbar <laughs> when i interview him and host him on this show I'm sure he will be um, very eloquent about it, I hope, anyway. And we can continue this thought process. All right. Well, we will leave it there. But before we go, a brief reminder that we are going to Rome in October of 2024, nine months away from now. Tiffany and I will be taking some listeners, those of you who decide to sign up and join us on five days, six nights, Five mornings of excellent, exclusive, insightful, one-of-a-kind, eye-opening, mind-expanding walking tours through Rome, where you will come to understand the city. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you will come to understand the city in ways that you could never imagine, no matter how many times you've been to Rome. You will see things differently. You will discover things that you've never noticed before. And if you've never been to Rome, it is the best, as far as I'm concerned, introduction to an ancient and a marvelous place that I can possibly imagine. We are taking, what, up to 20 people maximum, 10 rooms only are available to be reserved. Join us in early October. I kid you not, having something on the calendar to look forward to this far out is wonderful, actually, I have to say. I was just in a meeting at another one of my jobs, and my boss in that meeting said, anybody who knows that they have a trip coming up, no matter how far out, I'd love to know so that I could put it on the schedule. And I was like, I've got a trip far out. You know, I almost was so happy about it. I almost announced it in the meeting. I'll be gone in October. (laughs) It does feel really good to have something that's going to be unique and unforgettable adventure on the calendar. So if you want to know more about how to join us in the streets of Rome in person for a, an amazing week, just send us an email, bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. Bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website, thebittersweetlife.net, and send us a note through there, and we will send you all of the details. We are half sold out already with nine months to go, so... If this sounds interesting to you, I uh, I encourage you to write to us, bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, we hope to have you with us. That would be great. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. Hi, my name's Rob. I live in Toowoomba, which is a regional city just about an hour and a half west of Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. I discovered the Bittersweet Life podcast quite late. The show had been going for a number of years before I discovered it. So Katie and and Tiffany have been my passengers in my car, driving to work and back every day while I frantically catch up with all of the uh, podcasts. I'm now caught up with them. So now I just hang out looking forward to the uh, next edition each week. 
I was uh, looking for a podcast that um, was specifically about expats living in Italy. My wife and I have made numerous trips to Europe, but um, you know, Italy has been our favorite by far, and particularly my favorite. I'm obsessed with everything Italian, and the girls uh, do an excellent job in covering that. But not only that, one of the other things I love about the show is that it also has quite a number of other diverse topics and guest speakers and things like that, which really uh, makes it a lot more interesting than just the uh, the other podcasts that are out there about Italy. Uh, the production on the um, show is sensational. You know, it's um, second to none, and I congratulate the girls on all of that which is one of the reasons why I feel quite comfortable in uh, donating. And uh, I think that, you know, we should all donate to these things because without our donations, these shows can't continue. And I feel quite comfortable in doing that on a, hopefully a, a bit more regular basis than the one or two times that I've done it so far. I absolutely loved receiving my letter from Katie thanking me for my donation and also a little bit of uh, personal note in there you know that along with some of the uh, little comments on Instagram or uh, emails and things like that really makes a listener feel like part of the show rather than just uh, listening to something that somebody has produced and just scattergunned out there so all I need to say is uh, congratulations to the girls again. I hope the show just keeps going and going and going. If you're thinking about donating to the show, people donate. A few bucks makes a huge difference and hopefully uh, everybody's few dollars will, will make a big difference and keep the show going. Thank you. If you love this show, support it. For as little as $5 every month, you get to hear two bonus episodes and even say hello during upcoming meetups online. That's every month for as little as $5. Visit thebittersweetlife.net and click support to explore ways to pitch in to keep this show you love on the air.